Okay. Good evening. Welcome to our Mar or February Ask a Physicist. I will just make a few announcements before we get started. Um, as usual, um, this will is being recorded and we will post it to our YouTube channel if you want to watch it again or um, share it with somebody who you think would be interested. Our next Ask a Physicist will be March 27th at the same time, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And the subject is, did life on Earth come from Mars? And then for tonight's webinar, if you have any questions um, during the talk at all, just submit them at, uh, using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to the questions towards the end of the hour. And then um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul Davies to make a little announcement. Uh, yes, hello everybody and wel welcome back to Ask a Physicist. Uh, I'm not moderating this uh, uh, session, uh, but I just would like to make a quick announcement about a forthcoming really important event. So every year the Beyond Centre puts on a special lecture called the Beyond Annual Lecture. And over the years we've had uh, the great and the good from right across the sciences. And uh, this year uh, we're very pleased that uh, we're hosting a lecture by Stefan Alexander. Uh, who was born in Trinidad, educated in the Bronx, and is a jazz playing cosmologist. Uh, and he's going to be uh, giving a lecture called A Hip Hopper's Guide to the Universe. And I'm going to just try to show you a slide of that, just so that it is uh, share screen. Here we go. Uh, it's not the screen we want. Uh, there ought to be a more elegant way of doing this, so please do bear with me. There we are. Uh, and so, uh, Neeb Hall, seven o'clock, uh, and this is an in-person lecture. We're very delighted that we can go back to holding uh, lectures in person. So please do come along to Neeb Hall, at seven o'clock. It helps if you register in advance, but you don't absolutely have to. Uh, we would like to see you there. So that's all I have to say. Um, I will now hand over to Malik, who is going to moderate this evening's events. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and welcome everybody to uh, tonight's session of Ask a Physicist. Today, we're very happy to have Professor Steve Desch, who's from our own School of Earth and Space Exploration at ASU. He's a professor of astrophysics. He's been at ASU for about 20 years. And um, his research is on planets and stars and, uh, and me more generally meteoritics. Um, and I just found out that he even has an asteroid named after him. Um, so, uh, so which is very appropriate given the subject matter um, of today's talk and specifically today we're going to talk about interstellar objects in the solar system so um on to you steve all right thank you very much and it's really a delight to be here and uh my plan for tonight is to uh show you two powerpoints one is about the interstellar object oumuamua and uh i'm going to have to take a uh, longer presentation and try to condense it into about 15 minutes and then i want to spend 10 minutes or so talking about this uh, interstellar bolide uh, that uh, crashed off of the coast of papua new guinea in 2014 and the attempts to recover it so uh with that let me try to um, find and pull up and share my um, screen here Let's see. And I think I can go to um, slideshow if I can see my slides. Um, play from start. How's that? OK. Yeah, this was a talk that I gave to the um, Astronomy Club recently. So you may have heard of Oumuamua, and it was the first big object that we saw uh, from outside of our solar system passed through our solar system. And it was discovered by the uh, PanSTARRS telescope array on the uh, summit of Haleakala in Hawaii in October of 2017. And it was moving at a speed that would not keep it bound to the sun and it's on its way out of the solar system. 
And it was the first object discovered. It was expected that we would discover an interstellar object because we know that our solar system ejected something like a trillion comets sometime early in its birth. And so it was expected that we should see comets from other solar systems pass through our solar system. But this object was kind of like a comet, but not like a comet. And within a few years, there were a number of mysteries that have piled up, including that, uh, you know, there, there seemed to be quite a lot of these. The PanSTARRS telescope array was only in operation for a few years and already detected one of these. And so that implied a, a rate of these objects or a number of these objects that was orders of magnitude higher than the number of uh, comets that we expect. And it entered the solar system at a sort of weird velocity. It pushed away from the sun uh, a little bit. And comets do that too, because the sun shines on them and gases are uh, sublimated from the ices. But this was more acceleration than any comet has been observed to see. And it had this crazy cigar shape or pancake shape. And there was no dust tail and no CO gas, carbon monoxide gas. And so for all these things, it was different from a comet. And so there's a long mystery about what it was. I say long. It really wasn't that long. It was discovered in 2017. And we um, actually, my co-author, Alan Jackson, and I, were able to uh, get published in 2021, a pair of papers where we talk about what it was and how it was probably formed. And uh, what I'd like to convince you of is that it's a piece of nitrogen ice that was probably ejected from the surface of a Pluto-like planet around another star. And if you were to take a piece of Pluto's surface today, which is mostly uh, frozen nitrogen uh, gas, like the um, nitrogen gas that you're breathing right now, if you were to freeze it, you'd have something like the surface of Pluto. And if you took a piece of the surface of Pluto and put it by the sun at these speeds, it would behave in exactly like Omomo did. And the only mystery is why there were so many of these, but actually uh, that's not really that mysterious after all either. Uh, our own solar system must have ejected way more fragments of nitrogen ice from Pluto-like planets in our solar system than, uh, than comets and other things. So just to expand on this a little bit so you have some context, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to play this. Yeah, the movie didn't work. But the object came in from outside the solar system. It went um, by the sun. It actually went as close to the sun as uh, a quarter of the Earth's sun distance. So that was inside the orbit of Mercury in September of 2017. And then it went by Earth in October of 2017. The Spitzer Space Telescope was able to take some infrared observations of it in November. And soon after that, it was too far away and just too small for us to see. And so all of the observations that were ever made were done in those few months. And uh, let's see, I want to skip to just the important ones, but it came from the direction of the star Vega, and that was somewhat significant. And the velocity it had when it entered the solar system was about uh, 26 kilometers per second uh, relative to the sun. But you have to kind of imagine that all the stars in the solar system are kind of moving at uh, in a in a flow, like they're moving in traffic. Now, some cars weave in and out of traffic, and some go a little faster, some go a little slower, and the same is true for stars. And the sun itself is moving around the galaxy a little bit faster than the other stars in the vicinity by about 18 kilometers per second. And that means that Oumuamua itself had to be moving towards us um, at 26, but when you subtract, it ends up being something like nine compared to the other stars. And it was kind of inferred that that seemed a little slow, but uh, as it happens, that is the typical speed of very young stars. Young stars do not weave in and out of traffic as much. It takes a, a while. Uh, stars have to uh, be, be affected by the gravity of other stars, and that, that takes billions of years to build up. So when stars are, are new, they don't really um, uh, speed <laughs> that much. So Oumuamua's speed is really indicative of coming from a young solar system. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's not the most important detail. Some of the most important details have to do with the shape. And the shape is inferred. I want to emphasize this, that we never got anything more than a picture of a dot 
of Oumuamua. It's just this little tiny uh, speck of light. But we can infer the shape by how bright or dim it gets over time. And this is a summary of a lot of telescopic observations. And the brightness goes up on this axis. And these are different times. So you see it got brighter and dimmer. But the, the variations here are really quite dramatic. Sometimes it's like 10 to 1. It's 10 times brighter sometimes than others. And this uh, led to models where it was a very elongated object that's uh, tumbling through space. Now, it turns out the first models that were tried were cigar shaped, which is a little bit unfortunate because uh, while that kind of works, uh, it made everybody think of rendezvous with Rama and imagine uh, an alien spaceship coming through the solar system. Also, so what works for this model and actually is more probable is a pancake or a coin shape. And you can imagine that sometimes that will be facing you and sometimes you'll see it at John. And that's why you get these dramatic changes in brightness. So we understand that, but the, um, the variations in the axes, uh, if it's coin shaped or pancake shape, it must be six times wider than it is thick. And we see objects that are sort of two to one or three to one. We've never seen an object in the solar system that's quite six to one like that. So that's that was a mystery. Uh, as I said, it was uh, accelerating away from the sun, or rather, I should say, it was not decelerating as much as you'd expect if it was affected by gravity alone. So when it went by the sun, it was moving at 88 kilometers per second. Uh, it slowed down as it left the sun because the sun's gravity was pulling it back. Uh, but it still has enough excess speed to leave the solar system. But it was just a little bit different than the acceleration due to gravity alone, and uh, something like one part in a thousand. And the acceleration, the variation there, it, it varied as one over the distance squared from the sun, which suggests that it has something to do with the amount of sunlight that's reaching it. This is an image of the comet 67P that was imaged by the uh, Rosetta spacecraft. And you can see that the sunlit side the ices are being heated by sunlight and sublimating and these gases are coming off and that's pushing it away from the sun. And that push is proportional to one over R squared because it has to do with the sunlight. So comets do this. It's just that comets, the acceleration is, is more like one part in 10,000 of the gravity. And here, this was one part in 1,000. I think it's worth mentioning uh, that, you know, we're talking about a process that is very much like comets. It was just a push away from the sun. It was a very small fraction of the, the gravitational acceleration. And uh, it's, it's very much in line with what comets do. It was just a little bit different in magnitude. And it is certainly not the case that it took a left turn as soon as it saw Earth or something. It, it just was doing a natural thing. Just we didn't understand it quite so much. Um, and so there were all these mysteries that had piled up, and by um, 2018, they were compiled into uh, a sort of paper online called, uh, by Bale and Loeb. And there seemed to be a lot of objects, uh, must have been orders of magnitude more of these objects than comets. It was moving towards the solar system a little bit slow. It was very elongated. It had this different non-gravitational acceleration. And the Spitzer Space Telescope that looked at it in the infrared did not see any levels of uh, carbon monoxide or dust or anything. So for these reasons, it was not like a comet and a little bit mysterious. But uh, it turns out that um, we modeled this as a, a piece of nitrogen ice. And there's a few things about, uh, you know, if it's nitrogen ice, nitrogen ice is something that exists on the surface of Pluto. It requires extremely cold temperatures. And so you can imagine it's very easy to vaporize. When you vaporize a chunk of ice and it doesn't start off perfectly spherical, but you start vaporizing equal amounts of material from all sides, it is just a mathematical fact that it becomes more el um, elongated. So you can understand this really thin six to one axis ratio if you start it with something that was more normal and you vaporized a lot of it. And it made a lot of sense to us that it would be made out of ice and, um, and that if it were a very volatile ice, you could uh, give it a stronger push away from the sun. And so um, we did a lot of calculations, I'll leave it at that. And the upshot, Omomo was exactly as shiny as the nitrogenized surface as Pluto. It would get a push away from the sun exactly as much as Omomo did. And so 
it behaved in all of these different ways, exactly as you'd expect. And we can model this, and we can model how close it was to the sun at different times, what its surface temperature was, how much mass it lost. And it lost something like, in our model, 95% of its mass as it went around the sun. And, uh, and what we saw was just a very small thing that was only, I mean, it's no bigger than a football field by the time we observed it in October of 2017. And the, the axis ratio would have increased. So in every way, um, Oumuamua, it behaves just like a piece of nitrogen ice. And it's so small, and it is um, almost pure nitrogen, that it's actually no surprise that we didn't see anything else. The Pluto, Pluto's surface does have, a, this is Pluto, it does have um, a lot of nitrogen ice. It has a little bit of carbon monoxide. It has a little bit of methane. But at the size of Omomo and the rate it was evaporating, um, these, these elements, these compounds would have been below detection limits of Spitzer. And Pluto's surface has no dust. So again, if you had a piece of ice knocked off of a Pluto-like surface, it would not have dust. Uh, it, we, we could observe um, the emission uh, from nitrogen gas. It's, there's a blue color associated with it. But there was so little of it that again, that was below detection limits because this is just such a small object, again, like less than uh, 10 meters in size. So um, in every single way, if you took a piece of Pluto's surface, threw it by the sun, it would act and behave exactly like Oumuamua. So the only question is why there were so many. And uh, to understand that, you have to uh, understand a few things about the Kuiper belt, the um, disk of material that orbits, you know, planets like Pluto, comets, et cetera, that orbits beyond the orbit of Neptune today and how it formed. And one of the leading theories of how our solar system formed is that very early on at about 100 million years into the solar system's evolution, you know, and it was much younger than its current age of 4,500 million years old, uh, the, the configuration of the planets was different. It's as I depict here, where the uh, planets existed between five Earth-Sun distances and 15 Earth-Sun distances. And there was this disk of material uh, that added up to 35 Earth masses. And when the solar system formed, there was not one Pluto or just a few large Kuiper belt objects. There were thousands of Plutos. And each of them probably had nitrogen ice on their surfaces, just like Pluto does today. And the solar system existed in this stage until um, one day uh, it became dynamically unstable. And over the course of about 10 million years, it, it reconfigured itself into the, the system we see today. And um, the planets now, the giant planets now orbit between 5 and 30 AU. And what's left in the belt of material beyond Neptune is less than one part in a thousand of what used to be there. And I'll just say, suffice it to say that um, when we calculated how much material there was, how much nitrogen ice there was, and how many um, collisions between these objects there had to be during this stage when the solar system went dynamically unstable, and calculate uh, how many fragments there would be and what their sizes are, what we find is that you get a number of fragments that's uh, from surfaces of Plutos that are orders of magnitude greater than the number of comets. And these would have been ejected uh, from the solar system by gravity slingshots from Jupiter in the same way comets were. And when you add it up, if the solar system is typical then what you find is that you're, you're pretty close to the number of um, Oumuamua-like objects that out there in order to explain why the Pan-STARRS Observatory saw one within about five years. And in fact, I don't think, we don't think that the solar system was all that typical. We, we've um, continued this work since um, those papers came out in 2021 and infer that um, low mass stars, which there's a lot more of, uh, stars uh, around, you know, planetary systems around red dwarfs or such, these should have um, more of these Pluto-like planets and, and their fragments should be easier to eject. So if they went through similar stages and a dynamical instability like our solar system did, they would actually eject an order of magnitude more um, fragments per 
star than, than ours did. And when you put it all together, it, it becomes very, very viable and plausible that um, you should expect nitrogenized fragments like Oumuamua. So um, yeah, there's actually not really a lot of mystery about all of this. Uh, we expect that, you know, I'm gonna skip all of this because uh, the summary is just what I said, but um, Oumuamua, the way it behaved, it, it, it's exactly matched by a piece of nitrogen ice like the surface of a Pluto. The only question is why it, why we saw one so quickly, why um, it seemed, you know, when it seems like it would be improbable, but the reason is simply that um, our solar system actually was pretty good at ejecting such fragments because of the way it formed and other solar systems would have been even more effective. And um, it's really exciting because what this means is uh, we have a really viable natural ex explanation for Oumuamua and it's a piece of another planet and we know about exoplanets, but what we did not know is that, um, you know, we, we've seen some Jupiter-like exoplanets. Uh, we've inferred the existence of some Earth-like exoplanets. Earth-like is a fuzzy term, but we have never been able to infer the existence of Pluto-like exoplanets. And Oumuamua is telling us that they're probably very, very common. And some of the processes that our solar system went through must be very common as well. So, that's the first part of my presentations, and that's about Oumuamua. And it indicates to us, and I'm gonna stop share, and I'll pull up the other uh, presentation and share that. It indicates to us that interstellar objects are in fact something that, um, you know, are, are coming through our solar system, and we should be thinking about these things. And, it's, um, oh yeah, here we go, slideshow, play from start. There we go. So it's very intriguing that um, there is the possibility of meteorite type things, things that are sort of meters in size, uh, hitting the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, one of the things that um, Avi Loeb and his student Siraj um, realized is that there is this database of impacts and they look through that database and look to see if there are any interstellar um, objects as as identifiable uh, through their uh, velocities. So let me walk you through some of that and um, talk about that. So yeah, you may not know, but JPL runs the Center for Near Earth Object Studies and they maintain a database of uh, large explosions as detected by a variety of satellites. These are uh, weather satellites, as well as um, Department of Defense satellites whose mission is to look for rocket launches or nuclear blasts or other things like that. And as you can imagine, the, the latter type of satellite data is classified. And so, uh, Nevertheless, after some vetting, they give that data a little bit sanitized to uh, th this um, database. And, um, and this includes also some weather satellite data as well. And so here's a map of some of the large explosions that have happened in our atmosphere over the um, 35 years or so that this uh, database has been maintained. And you can see that um, we're constantly bombarded by by things from outer space. These are these are all um, impacts of meteorite type objects hitting Earth's upper atmosphere and penetrating to various depths and uh, have various energies. This is a logarithmic scale, and this red one here is actually Chelyabinsk, which um, hit in the Russian town of Chelyabinsk in, almost exactly ten years ago. And you may remember the dash cam footage and all of that. That was one of the largest explosions in the last century. All right, so uh, one of the objects in here is the one corresponding to this. This was an impact in January 8, 2014 off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And uh, here are the reported latitude and longitude and um, velocity vectors. And this is an obscure coordinate frame rotating with the Earth. And um, you get also the total amount of optical energy. And uh, this database, you can also download a light curve. You can see how bright it was at every second that it was detected. 
in general, um, you know, these meteors come in and they, they start to uh, encounter some friction with the air and then they heat up and they heat up to the point where they're incandescent. And then this, this is what's actually detected by the satellites. And then eventually they slow down as a result of the friction and then they enter dark flight and they're not detected by these. Um, and generally there's, there's one point where they kind of explode and you get maximum brightness. And that's what this data is referring to right here. And we have a lot of um, uh, empirical relationships that tell us how to convert the total optical energy into the total actual kinetic energy. And so this is what we measure, but this is what we have to infer is the total kinetic energy. And if you also know the velocity, which presumably you get from watching um, the object cross, uh, cross the surface of the Earth at various times, you can calculate the velocity and you know the energy, then you get the mass. So that's how this all works. And in this particular case, the, um, the geometry looked like this, looking at the Earth's orbit from above. Uh, this was sort of the orientation uh, at the time of the impact. The sun is this way, the Earth is moving this way, 30 kilometers per second. And this uh, object came in kind of almost directly towards the sun and hit Papua New Guinea. I want to point out it was moving at 45 kilometers a second when it exploded. And that explosion took place when it was 18 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, which is actually pretty deep into the Earth's atmosphere. Most meteors burn up uh, at much higher altitudes. It also must have been slowing down a bit to get to that point. And so actually, before it entered the Earth's atmosphere, it was probably moving at 49 kilometers per second, which means it was probably moving at 50 kilometers per second outside of Earth's gravity. And if you extrapolate backwards, you get 26 kilometers per second um, at the time it entered the solar system, which is a typical speed. Um, if you were to not account for these middle two things, um, there is a, a paper on archive uh, by Suraj and Loeb where um, they purport to calculate the orbit of the object and they don't calculate these things. And so you would get like 13 kilometers per second outside the sun's gravity by not accounting for things like how much it slows down before you observed it. Um, but this is clearly an excess velocity. It, it could easily escape to infinity um, and with some excess velocity. So it's definitely not gravitationally bound to the solar system. It is interstellar, if these velocities are right. And this is actually one of the big problems with this database is uh, this was, an object observed by the Department of Defense satellites. Uh, so its position is not reported to very good accuracy. Um, we, it could be right. I, I don't know that it, it, it isn't right, but it could be wrong. And the truth is that in that database, there are about a dozen objects that were observed also from the ground. And about a third of those the velocities are correct, as in they match the trajectories as observed from the ground. And in the rest, they're not correct. And sometimes those velocities are off by 90 degrees. So uh, we don't know that these velocities that are in the database are correct. They're just what was reported by the Department of Defense and there's no way to check them. So um, the Space Force issued a proclamation that this one was a-okay, um, which leaves us exactly where we are at the beginning. We can't check that. So we don't know if it was interstellar or not, but let's say it is. Let's say this velocity is correct. So based on the um, optical energy and the impact energy that we infer from that and the velocity it had, uh, the mass is about 460 kilograms, which corresponds to um, the equivalent of a, a sphere of iron that is about half a meter in diameter. So something like this big, you know, thing of iron. So it's not a huge object, uh, but it is moving at 45 kilometers every second. It broke up in a series of three explosions that were about 0.1 seconds apart, you know, within um, uh, that amount of time, it had three explosions. These could have been observed um, from the ground, but it wasn't. Uh, we'd like to get um, infrasonic waves or something. We don't. 
there's actually very little except the the uh, we don't have radar data for this either. There's just the um, satellite data. And so this is one of the problems is after it explodes and you have all these fragments, uh, then what did they do? They could have continued on the same velocity. Uh, they could have broken up into very tiny pieces that experience a lot of friction with the air and slowed down immediately or something in between. And in general, for smaller velocity explosions, you get a variety of fragments of different sizes, and these will distribute themselves over a strewn field. And that strewn field will be, just think about this geometry here, it'll be tens of kilometers long, and maybe only, you know, a tenth of a kilometer wide, but very long. And so there's a very large area over which any fragments might have uh, distributed themselves. Um, here's a map of the region, and you can, this is sort of the size of a strewn field um, superimposed that might be relevant here. And for comparison, this is where the fragments might be, and it doesn't seem so bad until you, you know, look at the scale of, um, this is the same scale, here's the Phoenix metro area, here's Tucson, you're looking at something that is sort of, sort of city size. And uh, this was over the open ocean. And the depth here is something like 1,400 meters, so you know it's about a, it's about a mile deep. Uh, Mark Fries is someone at NASA who has modeled a number of uh, these impacts and has successfully led recovery teams to get fragments, including some uh, that landed in the ocean. And his modeling suggests that this thing broke apart in those three explosions. One. Um, the ram pressure on it was 247, 122, and 62 megapascals. Uh, this is way stronger than a rocky meteorite could sustain, but iron meteorites typically survive up to 300, 400 megapascals. So this is definitely in the range of um, an iron meteorite. An iron meteorite would explode at these levels, and it would kind of take an iron meteorite to get all the way down to 18 kilometers after moving at 45 kilometers per second. Okay, but the energy that is involved here is tremendous. You are moving at 45 kilometers per second and, and slowing down very quickly as you enter the deep atmosphere. And uh, the energy that it would take to totally vaporize that iron is only 0 0.003 terajoules, which is way less than the 0 0.46 terajoules of impact energy that's involved here. So there's way more energy involved than it takes to just totally vaporize this object. And um, these very careful calculations from, you know, standard in the literature, Baldwin and Schieffer 1971, show that if you had a, a sort of thousand kilogram object like this, you would only um, be able to, to keep maybe 10 to the minus seven kilograms uh, from vaporizing. So out of this big cannonball thing, what we expect is something like um, milligrams of material to survive. Most of it being the form of ablated spherules of um, wustite or magnetite, uh, less than 10 microns in size, distributed again over um, square kilometers. And these would react with seawater within about one to two years and form hematite, which uh, notably is not magnetic. So, that's what happened to this object. So um, it would be really exciting if we had a sample of an interstellar meteorite. I would particularly be interested in the isotopic or elemental abundances and see if the isotope abundances in another solar system differ from ours, and it'd be nice. But this is just not a viable candidate to get that data. Um, for one thing, this is a really not well-known trajectory. There was no radar data. There was no seismometry applied to it. There was no camera network. There was no observations from the ground, et cetera. So it's really hard to pin down where that strewn field is. Um, and then, of course, you have a large strewn field data, a uh, large strewn field over which the material is um, uh, ejected. Whatever fell in the ocean nine years ago is now completely contaminated. It's been reacted with seawater for nine years. We probably wouldn't even recognize it. Uh, and the the amount of material and the area that is spread over is kind of equivalent to one microscopic 10 micron size grain per 30 tons of mud on the seafloor from which you'd have to sift. And that mud lies a mile underwater. And somewhere, somewhere 
there in an area that is the size of the Phoenix metro area. So it's just not a viable option to go there and look for any material, um, and it, it wouldn't be magnetic, um, and it would be impossible to find, recognize, collect, etc. And in fact, it's a little bit unfortunate um, that any interstellar meteorite is probably going to suffer the same problems of the high speeds. This object came in at three times the velocity and therefore an order of magnitude more energy than your typical solar system meteorite. And I just want to acknowledge the efforts of all these other people and groups who do recover meteorites. Uh, there's quite a lot of fireball networks, camera networks on the ground that are used or, or radar networks in, or a combination to try to get the trajectories as these things hit the ground. And now there are seven objects that were observed in space that have actually fallen to the ground. And three of these objects, we've got um, material recovered from them, including one uh, fall that happened in Normandy, France, just um, two weeks ago. And, it, and this fragment is cover, recovered. And um, in this case, you know, we, this was also about the same size, made of rock. And that's probably about the largest piece you'll get from it. Uh, and it took, because uh, they had all the radar, all the camera, a lot of data and teams of dozens of volunteers willing to scour the, the land <laughs> on which they stood and look for these objects, that it is possible to recover these objects. Um, and it's it's quite a, uh, an admirable effort when people do that. But uh, again, in, this interstellar object is, is just, it's not possible to recover anything. And so at that, I will stop and I will um, take questions and thank you for your attention. Um, Paul, do you want to uh, add something? I, I well, I just would like to uh, to add something. Uh, Steve, that that was uh, wonderful. It's uh, you uh, make the subject so fascinating and it's intrinsically fascinating anyway. But thank you for giving such a comprehensive background. Um, uh, th there's a few things I'd like to chat to you about, but before doing that, if I could just share my screen again, it's another little commercial. Um, uh, just bear with me, share screen. Uh, and this time, uh, what I want to share is, um, uh, sorry. Uh, I can just put it up like that. Um, I just wanted to mention to everybody uh, that uh, uh, there's a special issue of the journal Astrobiology on interstellar objects in the solar system. It came out just a couple of months ago. And uh, Steve Desch has a paper in there. I have a paper in there and a, a co-editor. Uh, so anybody who wants uh, more details about the, the whole subject uh, could go uh, take a look in that. Um, now, let me stop sharing the screen. I'm sorry, I'm not doing this very elegantly. Mm -hmm. Stop share. Um, so um, yeah, Steve, uh, just a few things I've been jotting down. Um, very unfortunate that there was no radar data. Do you suppose that uh, there is radar data, but it just has not been accessed so far? Because um, the air traffic control is uh, monitoring the skies all the time. I know it's, a, it's a, not a very highly populated part of the world. I've been to Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's a fascinating mm -hmm. place. Uh, but um, uh, I would still expect that there to be some radar coverage. Uh, do, you, do you think we could get hold of that data? Um, it's quite possible that there is radar data. And I do know that Mark Fries is working on using uh, seismometry data, which is just fascinating to me. When the, the explosion happens, there's a, there's a sonic boom. And you can triangulate where that sonic boom was over the ground to uh, pretty good precision. So I know that that data is being applied to this impact. And um, there's quite possibly some radar data, uh, but I'm not aware that it's being used in this purported search you know, for this object. So. Right, right. Yeah, but uh, looking at the bigger picture, um, so uh, I, I think if I remember my history correctly, that uh, astronomers were generally mystified as to why there were no comets coming in on hyperbolic orbits from other systems. And it seemed like uh, they'd been observing for centuries, nobody had seen one. And now suddenly, 
we know not just the one, not just the two, but at least the three interstellar objects, because there's a comet called Borisov, which uh, uh, I'm sure you know about, which was discovered shortly after Oumuamua. So suddenly they're all over the place. Um, and so is this a little bit like the case of extrasolar planets? Everybody thought they were out there, thought it would be really difficult to detect. But once the uh, people had started spotting them, then uh, they, they seem to all come in a rush. In other words, uh, can we expect now lots of interstellar objects to be... Uh, well, <laughs> as far as comets go, no. And it's, it's a very weird coincidence that the first really clearly interstellar comet was discovered just a year after Oumuamua, Borisov was discovered. But um, it was discovered by an amateur uh, when it was sort of almost at the distance of Jupiter. Um, you know, it's it's not particularly favorite geometry. It was just, it's just coming through the solar system and it clearly had an excess velocity. There are a lot of comets in our solar system that were just barely hyperbolic, which suggests that they were from the or cloud are associated with our solar system and maybe got a little kick from Jupiter or something. But this one, just clearly, there's just no doubt it's interstellar. And um, and we would have seen it, you know, if it came around a century ago, an astronomer would have discovered it. So the incident of those types of interstellar comets is indeed rare. And it's weird that we discovered the only one in the last century um, right after this interstellar object was discovered. Um, Oumuamua was much fainter, much more, barely, barely detectable by this Pan-STARRS telescope. As soon as it got a little bit further away after a few months, it was invisible. And if it had been on the opposite side of the sun, we would never have seen it. You know, it, there's a lot of reasons why um, we got lucky to see it. And uh, we'd probably wait a while if we had only the Pan-STARRS telescope array. It's been another five, you know, years or more that, um, we haven't seen another. So, um, but there are new and better facilities coming online. The Vera Rubin Observatory is another better array of telescopes. And with luck, we should see objects like Oumuamua um, once a year or so. And uh, we should be able to observe enough of them to get better statistics. But um, they certainly appear, I mean, to have seen this really difficult to see object uh, within just five years of of the pan stars coming online suggests that these must be much, much more common than comets. Now you uh, persuaded me that it's uh, probably a chunk of, of liquid, uh, solid nitrogen um, and uh, pointed out that it would have evaporated like crazy as it uh, plunged in close to the sun. Um, were you able to, or were the observations able to determine that it was noticeably smaller, therefore fainter on the way out than it had been on the way in at equivalent distance, or was that all just too uh, we, we only really observed it uh, for a few weeks, you know, and by the time we observed it, it had already gone past the Earth and was going away from the sun and had kind of stopped evaporating. So all of this evaporation took place before we even discovered it. Right. Well, yeah. So now taking a you know, much longer term view, um, I'm sure that uh, everybody listening to us knows about the, the death of the dinosaurs, the big impact 65 million years ago, and this was uh, identified by an iridium layer uh, deposited on the earth. Might there be, large, uh, be records of large interstellar impacts going back through geological time where there might be a layer of literally interstellar material that, that might be discovered one day? And, and how will we know? Right, uh, you know, and that's another thing that I've written about is uh, trying to um, counter this, uh, you know, Loeb and Siraj, they wrote a paper purporting that uh, the Chicxulub impactor, the impactor that killed the dinosaurs had to be a comet for various incorrect reasons. Um, there is a lot more material in our own solar system to collide with, and uh, things like Chicxulub are rare enough events that we only have one impact every 100 million years or so. I mean, there's only been like, um, you know, 50 over the age of the Earth. And so uh, given the rarity of interstellar objects hitting the Earth, we, we kind of don't expect that we would have hit certainly anything interstellar that big, and uh, probably nothing to leave a, a geologic record. 
So the chances of finding any uh, interstellar, sorry about it, chance of finding any interstellar material on the Earth, either because it's recently formed or for a long time ago, looks to be pretty remote. Yeah, I think so. This object, if it is interstellar, would be, you know, about as frequent as we expect. If if there's one or two objects like this in the CNAOS database, um, that would that would match our sort of expectations of how many interstellar objects are in the Earth. You have one sort of big cannonball thing every 20 years. And it would be um, quite a while before we could uh, mount um, a mission to an object like this. So in the spacecraft yeah nothing nothing like this yeah this is just way too small um there are mission uh plans developed by ESA for uh, the comet interceptor mission to send a spacecraft out there ready to intercept um one of these interstellar objects if another Oumuamua or Borisov comes through uh it has to be intercept we can't match speeds with it if we could match speeds with it, we could send a spaceship to another solar system. But um, we could go buy it at really high speed and take some quick observations. And so there are um, this. This is a mission that will launch by ESA in a decade or so to be ready I, for the next I'd, thing. I'd, I'd, I'd like to jump off. in here, hand, hand over to Molik to uh, moderate the questions. I, yes, I we have a lot of questions. Thank you. Me. First of all, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, we have a lot of questions. Some of, uh, were asked earlier by email, but there are also been questions coming in. And I want to just remind the audience that uh, if you have any questions, you can enter, ask them in the Q&A, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom. Um, so uh, a couple of questions of a similar nature from Howard Lannis and Shashank Arokar, uh, who ask, uh, what information about the parent stellar system can we uh, guess? Uh, or learn if from interstellar visitors if we ever get our hands on them. So uh, you, you want to go and find this material, what for? I mean, we could certainly test ideas you, looking at the elemental or isotopic ratios. We could certainly test ideas about how solar systems form, although it would be difficult because we won't know the um, provenance of such an object. We don't know which solar system it came from. Um, so it's, it's a little difficult to say. Uh, I think it's one of those cases where we're looking to see if there's something completely different. We kind of know what everything in our solar system was doing, kind of. But if we saw something really different, then um, that, that might be eye-opening. But I don't know. But it would be fascinating. Are there So Trevor Austin asks, are there any kinds of uh, ratios that you expect for uh, metallic, rocky, water ice, nitrogen ice, interstellar objects? Uh, in other words, do you have any sort of expect, prior expectations? So when we're talking about our model for how um, material is ejected from Pluto-like surfaces, uh, we predict sort of uh, comparable amounts of water ice and nitrogen ice fragments to be ejected. The um, relative numbers of metallic and rocky things um, are harder to get at. Um, certainly, we don't address them, but it's going to be smaller. There's going to be fewer of those ejected. Uh, because they're ejected mostly from the equivalent of the asteroid belt in our solar system rather than the Kuiper belt. So it, there's not as much material and it's closer to the sun and, and more in the gravitational well. So you get less of that material ejected. However, it would also survive better through the galaxy um, and, and could last billions of years instead of 100 millions of years. And so it's it's kind of hard to work out the, the ratios, but I kind of expect more water and nitrogenized things anyway than rock and metal, but uh, all of these things are possible. Okay, and here's a, a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, would there be any issues recovering interstellar meteorites from say the moon? Mm. You know, I, I think the velocity here is the key thing because in order for something to be interstellar, uh, it has to, be coming in from outside the solar system by the time it reaches the earth's orbit it's already moving at um you know 40 plus kilometers per second and then um as you saw with this object it kind of hit the earth at 50 kilometers per second um and it's just impossible for any materials any natural materials to, to survive the impact it's it's really difficult to imagine a scenario where it wouldn't just completely vaporize uh, at those speeds, you know, most like the the fall in Normandy this week, that was a one ton object. And what you sur have surviving is two kilograms. 
And the reason is, you know, that you even get 0.1% uh, of the material to survive is because it only came in at 15 kilometers per second. Again, if you if you triple the speed and you have an order of magnitude more energy, it's just impossible for these things to survive. So I, I think that's a major problem and um, with recovering any interstellar material. So that suggests that our best bet is something like uh, interception or flybys to um, before, it, mm -hmm. before it all vaporizes. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, can you uh, comment? Uh, do we know, uh, have we learned anything more uh, in the years about um, the comet that wiped out the dinosaurs, or, or if it was a comet, uh, and and what the origin of that was? Yeah, and um, you know, I participated in a paper um, uh, affirming the scientific case for an asteroid, and. Uh, it was very educational for me to, you know, go through the literature and compile this. It's kind of known, but out there and distributed in a lot of different places. Uh, we published our work in um, Astronomy and Geophysics, which is the uh, official publication of the Royal Astronomical Society. And uh, it's free access online if you want to search for that. Um, but there were there were definitely fragments left in uh, different levels. There were these high levels of... Um, uh, rare metals, uh, including iridium, in the clay layer around the world. There were amino acids, and uh, for various reasons, yeah, we have a we can pin down exactly kind of which meteorite type corresponds to uh, the, the Chicks Lube impactor, and um, we've learned quite a lot about how this probably went down, and you know, it was probably for something from the outer asteroid belt that was perturbed by Jupiter and, and moved in, and. Uh, yeah, our our story is becoming more complete. Um, it suffers a little bit that that the Earth and paleontology fields that kind of are part of that story don't connect usually. They don't speak as much to the the planetary scientists and the astronomers, uh, so that you have the complete story. But it is out there. We're really learning a lot. So uh, I guess you're not a fan of uh, Lisa Randall's theory about. Uh... Uh, about dark matter uh, having uh, having precipitated this uh, comet, uh, this um, asteroid. You... Uh, are you? I, I'm not even aware of it, frankly. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I feel like <laughs> which which philosopher? You know, sir, I have no need of that hypothesis. You know, Occam's razor says that there's there's meteorites, you know, falling on Earth all the time. I would actually. Love to show you a few, if you don't mind. You know, we've got um, here's a piece of an iron meteorite that um, I, I bought, and you can see this is a chunk of iron, like uh, we're talking about with this interstellar object. And here is another uh, carbonaceous chondrite. This is kind of a little bit more um, analogous to the Chicks Lube impactor. This stuff hits Earth all the time, and you know, why do you have to make something up? <laughs> to explain this, so. uh, somebody because I'm afraid I was the one who put her onto that. Um, <laughs> so it's it's not a suggestion that it was dark matter hitting the Earth dealing with dinosaurs. It's that as the solar system orbits the the plane of the galaxy, it goes up and down through the plane on a cycle of thirty. Well, I think 60 million years, but every 30 million it goes through the more crowded region of the galaxy. And uh, there's a hypothesis that uh, that leads to more gravitational encounters, which stirs up the Oort cloud and leads to a spate of, of uh, comets. So I think that's that's what the hell oh, is behind. Thank so you. Not, that that not, does not help. Maybe yeah. it's just after it might appear at the first time. Yeah, uh, it's, it's an alternative to saying it was Jupiter's fault. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Periodicity of um, the extinctions, though, is itself not an established fact in paleontology. So, right, right, it's a bit vague. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, there's a comment that's uh, basically asked for a clarification about these different about different terms. It says, "What was it? A meteor or a comet?" So maybe you can just explain the, uh, to everyone what yeah. the, what the, um, all these words mean. So uh, when things hit the Earth, we call them meteors when they're going through the atmosphere, they're meteoroids before that, and they're meteorites after they're on the ground. 
Um, and then the distinction between uh, comet and asteroid, we usually think of meteorites as coming from asteroids because they're rocky, uh, but it's certainly possible that, uh, you know, dust and ice even from comets can enter the Earth's atmosphere and form meteors too. And in fact, most of the meteor showers we know of are caused by dust trailing from comets. Um, what is the difference between a comet and an asteroid has become a little bit less uh, clear in recent years. Um, we've learned that some asteroids are, they have a sizable amount of water ice in them that could vaporize if you were to heat it. And uh, comets themselves are not, I mean, they've been called dirty snowballs for a long time, but they have a substantial amount of solid material too. But for the most part, we think comets are things from the outer solar system, you know, like beyond Jupiter, uh, that have a substantial like half uh, or 30% ice. And uh, asteroids are the source of, uh, you know, meteorites. And these typically don't have more than, you know, 10 weight percent water and probably less. So... I hope that helps. And it was definitely a, uh, a rocky body that um, killed the dinosaurs. It was not a cometary body. And um, one of the main things, uh, reasons we know this is the amount of iridium that was in the clay layer that is in that um, extinction level uh, worldwide layer. And um, we know the energy of the impact from the size of the Chicxulub crater that has been imaged under the sediment in the Gulf of Mexico. And if it was a comet, it would have come in really fast, and that would have involved a smaller object that itself was half ice. And you would have had a factor of, I don't know, 10 or 20, too little iridium in that case, uh, compared to if it were an asteroid coming in, you know, giving the same energy, but at a slow speed, it must have been a massive object. Okay, uh, we also have a question from just now from Steve Bruff, who asks, is it possible that Oumuamua's um variation in observed brightness is in part a function of bimodal albedo of the body, such that it's yeah. shaped more normal? Really interesting question. You always have to be careful when you have a light curve. Um, there is a moon of Saturn, Iapetus, which for um, weird reasons is completely covered in dust, on dark dust on one side and completely covered in water ice on the other side. So it has a really big difference in brightness uh, that is um, almost as big as this variation with Oumuamua. Um, but, you know, there's there's a specific reason for that. As it goes around, it, it scoops up dust from another moon in Saturn's orbit. Um, I, we've just never seen variations on small objects of that magnitude. And um, it, again, it's a very small object. And it, it's just the fact that it's getting a push away from the sun implies that it's losing material, its surface is changing. And it's probably one material, you know, when you when you think about it, it's one type of ice, it would be, it's almost impossible to imagine a scenario where it's bright on one side and dark on the other. Okay, we're just about out of time, I guess we have, well, maybe have time for one quick question. So uh, you mentioned iridium as a uh, famous sort of telltale sign of uh, impact from uh, the tricks of mm -hmm. the uh, asteroid yeah. that wiped out the dinosaurs. Uh, there are a couple of questions from Barbara Temple and Fallon Taylor basically asking about uh, other sorts of uh, materials or uh, that could have been deposited on, uh, on Earth uh, from... Uh, by meteorites. Yeah, so the iridium is a telltale sign of an extraterrestrial impactor because uh, basically everything in the solar system and frankly, everything in other solar systems probably has similar abundances uh, of, of different things. And iridium is a rare metal, but there's a certain percentage of, of the atoms on a planet that should be iridium. And the Earth probably formed with some iridium. The problem is that when the Earth formed and its core formed, all that iridium dissolved into the metal that went into the core. And Earth's iron core has all the iridium and there's very little left on the surface. So when you do see some iridium on the surface, um, you know, at a, at a measurable level, it's, it's uh, almost certainly extraterrestrial because asteroids, they also have iridium, but they never got big enough for it to all go into a core that we never see. They, they often have iridium distributed throughout. So um, yes, it would be nice if we could um, identify uh, an object 
as interstellar, but um, you know, as I've just said, it's it's not so much that the object that hit the Earth was so weird. You know, the asteroid that hit the Earth and and killed the dinosaurs was was normal for an asteroid. The problem is Earth is depleted in these things, and so I think the story is kind of the same, whether you're looking at an asteroid from our solar system or from another solar system. You would you would um, look for these sort of same things, and you would know it was extraterrestrial. Whether it's from another solar system or not is an even subtler story, and it's possible. You know, if you could get a sample of a iron meteorite from another solar system, you could maybe see it has slightly different abundances of things. But um, it's not as clear a story as 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 the story that we know Chicxulub was extraterrestrial. Okay, we're out of time, and uh, thank you for that again, Steve, for that uh, wonderful um, presentation and answering everybody's questions. Um, so I think I will just end by passing it off to Jessica. If you have any announcements again about next, uh, the, about the next, um, ask a physicist. Um, just like I said at the beginning, it will be on March 27th and it's going to be, did life on earth come from Mars? And just to be on the lookout for the usual emails and social media posts when registration opens. And then other than that, obviously, just for those local are beyond the annual lecture on March 2nd at 7 p.m. So thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Good job,